Welcome everyone to the Dr. Abs HealthCast. I'm your host, Dr. Brian Abasolo, aka Dr. Abs. And on today's show, we have a special guest. Her name is Taylor Nolan, who is a psychotherapist and host of Let's Talk About It podcast. Known for popularizing emotional intelligence on The Bachelor and is creating space for meaningful conversations around taboo topics like social justice, mental, and sexual health. Can't wait to talk to her. Let's get it started. Hey, Taylor. Welcome to the HealthCast. How are you? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks for having good, me. Good. I'm glad to see you're healthy and safe. Uh, how's everything going yeah. with this whole uh, quarantine situa situation during the uh, COVID-19 crisis? Yeah, it's going okay. I'm actually, I live in Seattle, so okay. kind of where things started yeah, a little bit. Washington, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, it's not so different from my normal day to day. Most of my work is done at home anyway. Okay. Um, I'm seeing clients virtually now and nice. it's a beautiful day here and we've actually had some decent weather since all this has okay. happened. So spending a lot of time out on my balcony, soaking up the sun yeah. and doing stuff with my plants and my cat. It's, yeah. <laughs> it hasn't been a terrible thing to just stay home. It's for crazy because I'm like it's a little here, lonely, but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I like I'm here in Miami and I see the weather and it's like absolutely like no clouds in the sky, super sunny. And it's like, geez, mm -hmm. like the world is like kind of falling apart around. But the the mm -hmm. weather is just absolutely beautiful. It makes you want to go outside, but we can't. So, um, yeah. mm -hmm. but that's good. I'm glad you're healthy and safe. So I just want to dive right in. Now, you mm -hmm. are a psychotherapist, correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so can you just give me a little background? Because I want to know, like, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, like, what led you to this career? And, uh, you know, why did you yeah. choose this path? Yeah, well, I think really when I look back at my life, specifically around middle school is when I think I can really pinpoint this interest for me because I was surrounded by people who were actually probably – pretty unhealthy for me. Um, but I was so fascinated at all the layers that they had. Um, in middle school was that period of time where we were experimenting with drugs and alcohol. And I just remember like most of my friends, I, you know, I experimented with drinking for about three months. If that, I never got fully drunk. And, um, from there I haven't drank since. And, oh, wow. um, Good I watched my friends. Yeah. Um, my friends got in some really bad situations and, you know, thought impact their health. And then um, in early high school, had some extended family members pass away from cirrhosis and, um, and cancer from chain smoking and just kept seeing substance abuse around me, um, you know, addiction around me and struggling to feel like this is so preventable. Yeah. Like, why are people choosing to do this? Why is this, you know, why, how is this disease even coming about? Like it, it really intrigued me. And I was so fascinated to like peel back those layers from people, even just in middle school of, you know, wow. what pain are you trying to numb? Like what else is there? Like what is happening in your life? And I took an AP psych course in high school and I was like, this is the best course ever. <laughs> like, I was like, this is yeah. just life. Like, everyone should be learning about this and how cool is that that your career could literally just be about life and yeah. um went on to get my bachelor's in psychology and did a lot of substance abuse rehabilitation there um a lot of group work in baltimore i loved doing group therapy it was very 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 powerful work um yeah. and then realized you know i'm not good at numbers and statistics and research so i knew i wanted to do counseling specifically and be a therapist and went on to get my master's in clinical mental health counseling and did a lot of work um, in private practice around vulnerability, a lot of work around shame, um, some eating disorders, depression, anxiety, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And uh, now I practice here in Washington um, since May 2019. I've been doing my practice and um kind of similar work around vulnerability and shame and um i'm working towards license here so i'm very cool still an associate working under supervision but i have about a caseload of seven clients that i see on a weekly basis and then i'm also in training now to be certified as a sex therapist so very doing cool. some sex therapy work as well which i'm super excited about but yeah that's all kind of the path that got me here in this career and 
it's really it's it's life's work like yeah. i i feel so privileged and honored and grateful to be in this field because it's such a I really call it like a sacred space. Like yeah. when you enter the therapy room, like it's a sacred space that, you know, is incredibly special to share yeah. that space with someone. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm curious. So what was it about those three months that you drank and you just said, you know what, this mm-hmm. isn't for me. Like, did you just not like it? Like the, the taste wasn't yeah. great. What, what was it? <laughs> yeah. So there's a few things. One, I really didn't like the taste of it. Okay. Um, two, I really disliked, seen how much people would lose control and end up doing things that they wouldn't do sober and to me it felt like a cop out a little bit but it also just seemed dangerous like if I want to do something stupid I want to at least know it's stupid (laughs) and know that if I wanted to be safe that I could be and watch my friends get in really vulnerable situations and I'm already a pretty physically weak person so (laughs) I was like you know scared honestly part of it was fear wow. that I don't want to put myself in a position where someone could even more easily take advantage wow. of me and um you know as as I got older it did also become about health and yeah. you know I'm pretty plant-based and um at this point basically vegan yeah. um but yeah I, I try to be really intentional about the things I put in my body that it's nourishing me and it just seemed like it was yeah. like toxic and just poisoning our bodies and, that's crazy how you yeah. had like the foresight and just like that willpower to say no at that time I and mean, you talked about a little bit about fear but i think it's mm-hmm. a lot of strength of mind where you were like you yeah know what i just because a lot of kids would just succumb to the peer pressure and whatnot and you said no to that yeah that's and it. i and i think a large part of it too was like i didn't feel a need for it yeah. like there was the, even today you know as in adults there's this need of like oh before i go out dancing i need to make sure i take several shots or before yeah. i go talk to that hot guy at the bar and for me i was just like well, courage. You didn't need do that. You, yeah i'm like do we really need to like lean on liquid courage like that no. just feels like such a cop-out and i wanted to weirdly challenge myself and be like you know how can i find that place of courage within myself to then be vulnerable and put myself out there and then how much more empowering and how much more um, authentic of a connection would that be or, or of an experience would that actually be? Because I would remember it, A, yeah, <laughs> which true. was also a big thing of like, I don't want to not remember my life. Like that yeah. sounds terrible. <laughs> well, kudos so, yeah, to you this- because I feel like, I mean, I've definitely, you know, taken on the liquid courage many a times in my past, but as I've gotten yeah. older, the less and less I drink, you know, just, I can't mm-hmm. recover like I used to. I don't know about you, but well, you, you, you not at all, but <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Never, I've never been hung over. I've never planned on yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not fun and it doesn't uh, get any better as you get older. So I want to talk yeah. about you in particular as a counselor, like what would you say mm-hmm. is like, what would you say is your strength and what about any limitations of you as a counselor? What mm-hmm. would you say those are? Yeah. So I would say one of my strengths as a counselor is my boundaries. I think um, a lot of people can struggle in the helping field to take on their clients' problems and and issues as their own. They can, you know, as empathetic people, really absorb a lot of those emotions and bring it home with them and, and struggle with that. And don't get me wrong, there's certainly cases where that's a little bit more difficult. But for the most part, I think one of my big strengths is um, in my boundaries. Like I leave that at at the office. I leave it after I do my notes and I'm done. Like you forget um, about it. Like you put that away until yeah. the next day. Yeah. Like I'm, so basically I do 50 minute sessions. And then in that 10 minute at the end of the hour is when I do my notes, I get up and stretch, I go pee, yeah. I reread my notes for my next client. And then I go into my next client. And by the time I'm finished with that note and I go to do my little pee break or my stretch, I'm like, I've got everything out from it. I was super present and I was really there. And now I'm on to the next thing. I'm with the next client or I'm driving home now and I'm thinking about all kinds of other things. Yeah, that's Um, awesome because I feel like a lot of like providers, like like in my field, like I deal with people that are in pain constantly. mm -hmm. So it's like. Imagine yeah. people telling you, you know, you see a ton of patients a day and now all of a sudden it's like every single person is this hurts, that yeah. hurts, you know, I'm so I'm in so much pain, you know, they kind of want to tell you about mm-hmm. their life a little bit. And yeah. you know, that energy 
translates over to you. So that's awesome that mm -hmm. you could kind of like shut that off. I know even providers that actually put a, you know, like magnetic fields, they put a magnet in their pocket to kind of block all the, the negative energy that comes their way on a daily oh, wow. basis. Yeah, they, they get intense about it, but that's amazing that you could, you know, separate the two. Um, so what's yeah. like your general philosophy when you're in your approach to your clients? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a very humanistic approach. Um, I very much look at it as a collaborative experience, okay. um, kind of to the, to the boundaries piece. It's I'm here to help you help yourself. Got it. So are you more Me, like guiding is, or is it like you need to yep. do this or is it more you let them yeah, find no, their own so, way? Mm -hmm, yeah, most it, the language of you need to do this, this is what you should do is more the language of like a life coach. Okay. Um, being in the professional counseling field, um, we're very much more there to help guide our clients to um, empower them, right, in their Got own decision-making because we don't want to foster that codependence, right? We don't want our clients to become dependent on us. Um, for me, it's really about helping them come to these conclusions on their own. I think one of the things, you know, in undergrad, I remember even being like, this might be something I struggle with as a therapist because I'll see the dots and I'll want to just connect them and be like, well, this is this because of this. Like, don't you see this? Um, but that's not necessarily my job sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Like you can it see it. Sense. You just got to help them see it through their own process yeah. of elimination or whatnot. Yeah, it's walking them through things. And, and sometimes my connection of the dots might not actually be accurate. And there will be times where I'll challenge a client and I will kind of lay that out. And I'll say, you know, let's maybe sit with this for a second. Like, does this feel authentic for you? Does that seem accurate what I'm saying? Or is this off? Um, but again, that's after building a lot of rapport. And yeah. for me, a huge part of my approach is this kind of person to person connection. While there are the boundaries and there is a... Um, kind of a, a power differential between client and therapist, I very much still want it to be a collaborative approach and invite my clients every step of the way, every session we're checking in and we're at, we're seeing how are things feeling, right? Like, does this feel like the right path that we're going down? How does doing this work right now feel for you? Does it feel really heavy? Is it feeling like it's exhausting you? Is it feeling like it's empowering you and you're uplifted and yeah things are making sense and you know, you're, you're kind of moving about the world differently. Um, I'm always kind of checking in at the end of each session and at, and at the beginning of each session as to where they're at, what they want to get out of sessions today. Um, and really working together as a, as a team, because yeah. I mean, if that rapport isn't there, then their ability and willingness to get really deep and share those really, really like, deep rooted, dark, scary thoughts, um, is, is going to be significantly decreased if yeah. that connection isn't there and they don't feel like it's a safe place. Yeah. So, um, there does have to be some sort of relatability for them. There does have to be some sort of understanding and rapport built. And, you know, I, I try very much, I, I go into my session and I'm just like, I, and we're going to try to see how we can work together. And, um, the clients I work with all right now, we have great rapport. And again, I just like every time I leave, I see, I see clients on Tuesdays and um, every Tuesday, I'm just like, this is so freaking cool that I get yeah. to like do this and that I work with these people and that like, they're really doing some intense work yeah, around wow. You're changing like, their lives. Shame and it's, it, yeah. And, but it's like, for me, I don't even look at it like that. Like, they are changing their lives. Yeah. Like I get to witness them. I get to support them yeah. through this, but that like they're doing all this work. Like it's not my work, it's their work. And they're really, really working it. And I get to be a part of that. And that's just why it's like, it's so special to and me. Do you like give them, let's say like homework assignments per se, like mm -hmm. to take home and Hey, work on this until next mm -hmm. session. Or is it like, just forget yeah, about so everything and we'll, you know, regroup <laughs> next visit. Yeah. Yeah, there are, are some sessions where things might have felt extra heavy and it's just kind of like, you know, take care of yourself, let this kind of sink in and we'll touch base next week. Yeah. Um, it also depends on the client. Some clients, they benefit more from just venting and just getting things out a bit and having that support and that validation. Yeah. Whereas others are like, I'm a very type A, like I need specific goals, I need specific tasks. 
Yeah. Therapy is not always this tangible process. A lot of it is intangible. Um, and so there will definitely be clients that I'll work with where every session, at the end of session, I first try to empower them to yeah. say, what's sticking out to you? What's feeling um, most impactful for you from today that you want to carry on and practice throughout the week? Sometimes they'll come up with something and we'll brainstorm something, right? Um, if I think back to yesterday, um, an example of this is we were talking about ways that our energy is, is drained and ways that it's filled. And her takeaway as a very type A personality, her takeaway throughout the week is to write down things at the end of each day that drained her energy and that filled her. And the next session, we'll kind of Break down process the list, that a bit, yeah. see, see what was going on. Why was it draining? Why did this fill you? And, you know, something might fill you one day and drain you the next day, right? <laughs> but yeah. it's, it's her practicing that awareness of, oh, okay, now I'm actually being mindful of, like, when I'm on the dating app and messaging this guy that I don't care about, like, this is really draining my energy. Yeah. When I'm, you know, on the phone with my mom, this feels really great. And I'm going to continue to do this kind of a thing. So there's definitely different homework steps. Sometimes it's, you know, yeah. watch this TED talk that we talked about during the session or yeah. something like that. But for the most part, there's usually a, a takeaway. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, that um, that rapport that you said, I, th I commend you. I mean, that's a skill, you know, that somebody has to have in order yeah. to get these people to be as vulnerable as possible. So kudos to you mm -hmm. for, you know, for getting that out of somebody. Um, so mm -hmm. a lot of people know you from The Bachelor. Um, yep. how would you say that that experience, uh, you know, molded your career or, you know, molded you as a person after, after you were on it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think my time around, uh, which was on season with Rachel, actually, um, I, it impacted my career in a sense of like, I really fully actually experienced depression for the first time. Like really? oh, wow. I personally was impacted on so many levels. Um, I definitely thought going on the show, I was very naive. I was 22 when I was in casting um, and had just graduated. And I, I thought, you know, I'm just going to go have this experience and then I'll just come back and, you know, be start normal, my practice. Just like, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> exactly. <a> <laughs> that <laughs> was very far from that. Um, so yeah, it definitely impacted my career in a sense of like, I was in my own world and I was having my own experiences. I, when I was in school, I did my bachelor's in three years and went straight to my master's and going on the show was kind of like, okay, if I do this, I'm kind of going off this path that I've had set for myself yeah. where I'd be fully licensed at 25 and be set in my career to just continue for the rest of my life, basically. Yeah. And, um, it, you know, I technically had opened my practice in May, 2016, the month that I graduated and didn't start actually practicing and seeing clients until May 2019. Wow. So <laughs> it, it definitely deterred the start time of that. But I think it also, you know, I was knocked on my feet. I was flipped way the fuck upside down after yeah. the show. And, you know, it gave me much more experience in life, which I don't think is required to be a good therapist with people. I want to be really specific on that because a lot of therapists starting off feel like they are inadequate because they don't have enough experience. And it's something people try to shame young people in the helping field on. And I don't think it's a requirement. I think you can still help people and do really powerful work with people as a young therapist without yeah. super traumatic life events. Um, but I think for me, it, it definitely did play a part where I was challenging myself in so many ways from vulnerability to control to shame, um, really just digging deep into myself and doing a lot of my own personal work. And um, I was really confident as a therapist before the show. And after the show, you know, unfortunately, my career was brought into my time there where a lot of disparaging comments were made about me being a therapist that while had zero validity yeah. um in, did impact me and I allowed myself to absorb those messages and so 
I even, you know, questioned my own abilities as a therapist after the show, um, which really there was no need for because I was not on the show as a therapist. I was on the show as, you know, a 23 year old young woman trying to challenge herself. Yeah. Yeah. And like looking for hopefully some kind of a connection um, in a totally different environment than anything she'd ever been in before. Um, Do you feel like it made you stronger? Like after you went all, you know, through the depression, you know, once you obviously, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Like you got through all of that. You maybe Mm -hmm. got a thicker skin because I, you know, I can totally relate to, you know, what you went Mm -hmm. through as far as, you know, people, disparaging your your career your you know all your studies that you Mm -hmm. went through and just want to basically throw that by the wayside but did you feel like you came out on top in the end like now when you're back in the groove of things you know Mm because I know I know you know you can maybe get a little lost during those years that you weren't practicing but once you got back to your roots did you feel Mm -hmm. like a little bit more empowered yeah a little bit I think you know I would say from maybe September to now yeah. I have felt that way. Okay. Um, right. it's, it's definitely been a, a long process. And I think in ways you can find gratitude through your trauma, but at the same time, it's like that trauma was a little unnecessary. So like, yeah. still would have been, would have been cool without that. Um, but it's, I think the most empowering piece of it for me is that I didn't, like I doubted myself, but I didn't think I could be here. Yeah. I didn't think that after that experience, I could go back to being a therapist. I didn't think that I could still host my podcast and do partnerships on Instagram and be a public person and just be myself who's a young woman dating and be a therapist. I thought I had to pick one. And you're doing it all. I, <laughs> and now I'm like, wow. yeah, part of me feels like, you know what, actually fuck that and fuck that. And, fuck all those people that told me I couldn't do this because here I am and I'm fucking doing all three. I'm doing all of it. (laughs) Doing all of it. So kudos to you. All right. So let's transition. Obviously I want to get into a little bit of your work. I, I, I did a little analysis on your IG. Um, I see you talking (laughs) a lot about sex and toys and just relationships and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say, give me some tips and suggestions for people that are looking when it comes to mental health, you know, there's a lot of anxiety going on right now mm-hmm. while in quarantine. Everybody's, you know, worried about their health, their finances, et cetera. Yeah. What would you, uh, uh, as a counselor, as a therapist, what would you say are some tips and suggestions for people to handle their anxiety? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So first I would say to kind of reach into your little self-care toolkit. And hopefully pre quarantine, you have already been able to identify ways to take care of yourself. And I would say to reach back into those things and like double the quantity. <laughs> so, you know, if you maybe okay. once a week do a, do a bubble bath, right. So kind of treat yourself and listen to music and light your candles and do your whole little thing. Maybe do that like twice a week or three times a week now. Um, so increase those things that you already have identified as self care. But in extension to that, I think one of the biggest, pieces of anxiety that people are struggling right with right now is control and struggling with having this lack of control over their day to day, uh, control over change. Um, and a big thing with that is mindfulness and meditation. And I know it sounds a little frou frou sometimes and it's like, God damn, everyone keeps talking about this meditation thing. I don't want to do it. You know, it seems like it gives me more anxiety to think about meditating because yeah. How do I do it perfectly? Um, and really just the, the impactful piece of meditating is it's bringing you to your present moment. So whatever you can do to get yourself really present in your immediate surroundings and your immediate day-to-day tasks, I think can help relieve that anxiety a lot. Um, when you're doing the dishes, literally – Focus in on that. Think about each plate. Think about um, the soap. Like, get really present in that. And if your mind starts to wander, that's okay. No need to judge it. No need to shove it down. No need to shame yourself or get upset with yourself. Just observe it and just say, okay, yeah, there's that stress coming in about that article I just read. Now I'm going to put this dish in the dishwasher. 
Um, I think another way to kind of help ease anxiety right now in general is to just actually maintain focus on your physical health. So Mm -hmm. making sure that you are cooking meals and making sure that, you know, you're staying home, that you're drinking enough water, like hydration is so, so, so important. Um, literally helps with our mental health. Like drinking water itself is actually soothing. Yeah. Um, you know, spice it up a little bit if you want to and put some apple cider vinegar or some lemon or something. Yeah. Um, and another thing I've been encouraging people to do during this time is just to allow space for play and exploration. You know, I, one of my clients just last night as we were talking, you know, she usually goes for walks, but she realized it's been so long since she's gone for a walk without purpose without a destination and how that allows the space for curiosity and exploration and play and also the unknown. Yeah. It's a practice in, in getting comfortable with the unknown. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously staying six feet, six feet away from people, wearing your mask, um, staying safe, but still allowing yourself some of that time for um, play in that form. Um, whether it's, you know, dancing at home or it's, masturbation doing some solo sex to explore and allow just allow space for that fun like i think during a really anxious time right now it's really easy to compare pain and it's really easy to force suffering upon yourself out of guilt that other people are suffering and that's not helpful it's not helpful for you it's not helpful for them it's okay right now to feel pleasure to allow yourself to play to experience love like to embrace those things and i think that all those things do help relieve anxiety and um can kind of help reduce the intensity of that and i feel like what you said in the beginning like all that stuff that you mentioned is like are like things that you can control you know what i mean mm-hmm. so yep. if we could just you know everything that we can control try your best not to think about that and like you said be in the moment you know practice mm-hmm practice self-care and, and what you can't control. Yeah. I think that's a uh, very key. Um, so mm-hmm. you touched a little bit on, on sex there. What would you say is the most common question that you get about sex from your clients? Mm-hmm. I mean, cause I imagine they divulge a lot of, you know, maybe intimate mm-hmm. details about that. What would you say? What would you say that would be? Yeah, definitely. The most common is lack of sex drive. Okay. Struggling good. with, yeah struggling with desire for sex, struggling with, um, now is this both men and women? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, there's a lot of pressure around sex. There's a lot of, uh, lack of communication and poor communication around sex because obviously where would we have learned that from our sex education in this country is quite shitty. Um, and it's something that's really vulnerable and something that we've been told is supposed to be private, right? So how are we supposed to know how to talk about these things? So um, there's a lot of that shame and pressure that I work with clients on to just reach a place where they can actually be present and experience pleasure. Yeah. I, what would you say to the, to those people that, you know, are having like, let's say it's a couple, a man and a woman, Mm -hmm. you know, their sex drive is low you know, what would you, what would you do or have them do or practice at home so that mm-hmm. you can maybe spice things up a little bit? Yeah. Well, first I would definitely inquire about just the overall status of the relationship. So, okay. um, when it comes to couples struggling with intimacy, um, it is not uncommon that, you know, there's a lack of desire there because there's actually a lack of connection okay. overall in the relationship. So first is kind of exploring that piece of the relationship. You know, are both partners overall satisfied in the relationship? Is there a lot of resentment or unresolved conflict that is, um, you know, creating a reduction in that desire? Um, If all those things are kind of good and it's just, you know, one person is maybe experiencing a lot of pressure around sex, um, one thing that I'll recommend is um, postponing the amount of time to when penetrative sex actually occurs. So there's frequently, you know, when we watch movies and stuff, right, we see that, like, people just, you know, they make out for two seconds and then, boom, close their off and bam, bang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, that oftentimes, especially for women, um, 
we need a little bit of time for our brains to get there. So yeah. doing things like making out for 15 minutes and just touching each other and allowing space for there to be maybe like teasing, um, allowing that to build up to where both partners can then be pretty present. Um, one, one technique that I've recommended to a client um, this past week actually was, um, you know, was struggling for her mind to kind of get there before like, it's just kind of, oh, okay, we're having sex now. And then by the time we're done having sex, I'm actually now there um, to, in a flirty way, communicate through her partner that he's not allowed to enter her until she has to beg for it, until she wants it so bad. Oh, wow. And she's really ready. She's really there. So, like, lots of foreplay, lots of making out, lots of touching. And then when she wants it so bad and she is like you know i'm completely turned on physically i'm i'm wet i'm um mentally emotionally i'm wanting it i'm actually very much desiring it and it's not just happening to me um so it's kind of like he went more at her pace essentially Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and just allowing there to be more time in that space not only to get present, but also to just increase your pleasure as well. Um, you know, if if she's able to be in a in a place where she's so turned on and then experiencing that penetrative sex, that's gonna be way more enjoyable for her than, you know, just going straight to penetrative sex and then realizing like, oh, I'm not really into this and like, you know, oh, I forgot to text this person back and like her brain just easily going to other places. Um, I think Another thing that, you know, I've recommended to clients in the past too is um, experimenting a little bit with like mutual masturbation. Um, So basically where in a way it can lead to sex, partnered sex, but um, allowing yourselves to essentially masturbate next to each other. um, And that way you are pleasuring yourself you're getting yourself kind of warmed up you're getting turned on perhaps by watching your partner and your partner is getting turned on by watching you um and then using that as a potential foreplay into penetrative sex when when both parties feel ready um a huge amount of this though you know there's so many different exercises and and tips and whatnot for increasing that pleasure between people but really that just that just comes down to communication Um, being able to explore and experiment with different things and communicating what you like and what you don't like and what you're curious about. There's got to be a... Is there a specific way that you would say, like, the communication should go down? Because I do think that's that seems Mm -hmm. like it would be a big problem, you know, if if your partner doesn't know what you like or Mm -hmm. vice versa, you know, that may be an issue, you know, may lead to problems in the bedroom. So. Is there like a way that you tell them to communicate? Is it just be as blunt as possible or, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of do it in a softer way? Yeah, there's depending on what it is that that they're communicating, right? Um, If someone is communicating um, what they want, for example, I don't know, say that you want to communicate to your partner um, that you want to receive more oral sex or that you don't, um, like it when they put their finger in your butt. Um, (laughs) there's, there's a way to go about communicating that you want more oral sex that is sexy and flirty and fun and can make your partner excited to please you. Right. Um, there's ways that you can do it that, might make your partner feel inadequate as well. Nice. Um, so we can kind of almost like role play that, you know, of like how you would want to communicate that to your partner. Um, and, you know, for things like, I don't want you to put your finger on my butt. I know that that turns you on, but it feels really uncomfortable for me and I don't enjoy it. Um, like, why not there are try things this? Where, yeah, yeah, there are things where like it can be, yeah. you know, mm-hmm, yeah, like one of the biggest things actually, those were like <laughs> random examples I just had in my head, but, one that's actually quite prevalent is um, wanting to communicate the lack of desire for sex. So when your partner initiates and you don't want to, of how you communicate that. Um, one of the biggest 
tips and things that I've worked with the clients on to help ease the the rejection. intensity of rejection. Yeah. yeah, to reduce that intensity is to suggest, you know, I'm not really in the mood right now, but I would love to snuggle. Or um, I really love that you're um, turned on by me right now. And I really want to be intimate with you later tonight maybe for now, could we massage each other? Um, so offering a form of intimacy that might be a little bit different than what your partner is initiating, but what feels comfortable for you um, is kind of one form of practicing that and not necessarily completely rejecting your yeah. partner and still allowing space for intimacy and pleasure that feels good for you. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Um, so based on your experiences, obviously you talked already about uh, communication. It's key, not only mm -hmm. in the bedroom, but outside the bedroom as well. Like, what would you say yeah. are the other top keys uh, to a relationship, to a successful relationship based on your experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, based on my personal experiences, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think based overall on both just kind of professional and educational experience, but also personal experience. Um, the biggest thing from the relationship is always the smallest thing. Um, most Details. of the time when, yeah, most of the time when couples are breaking up, it's not because of this one big event that happens. It's usually a buildup of Emulation, so yeah. many small things over an extended period of time. Yeah. Um, that's the biggest thing. So I think making sure that there is emphasis on the small things that um, when your partner is communicating their needs to you, that you listen, you hear them out. Um, I think overall having an emphasis and knowing that there is, there is a need to prioritize the relationship, to prioritize that quality time, um, to be consistently getting to know your partner on a daily basis maybe just weekly basis because yeah. um you know you might be living with your partner and that feels like you're spending a lot of time with each other but where's that quality time yeah. you know what when are you guys asking each other questions when's the last time that you were really curious about your partner right and learned something new about them yeah. um you could be with your partner for 15 years but they're still going to be changing they're still going to be, their world is going to be changing and there's still going to be new things to learn. Um, so I think maintaining that curiosity about your partner, continuing to date them, focusing on those small things um, and always being open-minded to communication with your partner. Um, I think to, to do your best, I know this is a struggle just in daily life in general, but to not take things personally, right? To remember that your partner is not there intentionally to hurt you. Um, I think that can be helpful when you are trying to work through conflict or just yeah. communicate about difficult things that, you know, remembering at the end of the day that, that your partner does love you and that the things that they're saying to you are hopefully, you know, out of love. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's so many things to that, but um, hopefully those are helpful example. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I had seen that you did a podcast on self confidence. And, you know, I feel like if you ask the man and a woman, like, what's the one thing, mm -hmm. you know, that the person that swept you off your feet had, you know, initially, when mm -hmm. you first met them or the few times you dated or whatnot. And I feel like self confidence is always a major theme, like they were just confident, you know, mm -hmm. more so than looks or personality, they just came in with a swag and a self confidence that kind of won you mm -hmm. over. Um, mm -hmm. but yet at the same you're time, about, I think, I think you're talking about yourself right now too on, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, like, yeah, that's, came one, through with, that's one with thing, hella swag, hella confidence. that's one thing that <laughs> Rachel did mention about me. So yeah, I guess I had it early on, you know, but at the same time, I feel like everybody struggles with self-confidence at some point mm -hmm. in yeah. their life. And I just think that's totally normal. So what differences do you notice how men and women experience self-confidence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think that the way that they experience that confidence within themselves, yeah. um, usually, unfortunately, uh, comes from the external expectations. Okay. So 
for men, typically, that's around things like being a provider, being strong. There's things that, that stereotypically females find attractive and, and males are typically then what how they express their self-confidence, right? Being very fit, being uh, successful. Um, for women, you know, when they got their face all done up and um, are, you know, got their booty in shape, whatever, uh, that is typically where I see people ex- expressing their self-confidence and feeling good about themselves. Yeah. Um, I think the true self-confidence comes from within. Yeah. It does not come from these external expectations or um, affirmations. And I don't think that it, I think parts of it can be physical, yes. But I think that true self-confidence really comes from within. I think true self-confidence comes from being comfortable and accepting, embracing of your authentic self. Yeah. So I think both men and women can go about that journey in very different ways, and it'll look different for everyone. Um, but I think would you say self-confidence... Like, would you say like essentially like because obviously like in social media nowadays everybody's you you feel like they're comparing themselves to other people that they Mm -hmm. see oh my god look you know this person's living such a lavish lifestyle or they're you know bigger stronger faster whatever the case may be Mm -hmm. like i always harp on the concept of like you versus you where it's like Mm -hmm. you're a horse with blinders on you don't worry about what other people are doing like you clap for them you know they're on their own journey you don't necessarily um you know, wish them any ill will, like good for them. You know what I mean? But at the same Mm -hmm. time, it's like you focusing on other, other people and what they're doing is going to prevent you from growing uh, your, your personal self. So it's like, if you just focus on what you got to do and just get better each and every day, like, I think that can Mm -hmm. also give you that self-confidence that you need as well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, one thing I, work a lot with people on that are people pleasers have people pleasing tendencies yeah. um, to prioritize other people before themselves. When it comes to self-confidence, we're often prioritizing other people's desires of us over ourselves. And yeah. kind of what you said, it's you versus you. I very much encourage, and, and I say this with my clients all the time that at the end of the day, you are left with you. Yeah. So are you going to be happy and, and comfortable and be able to stand by your decisions, by the things you say, by the way you act, by the the people you're surrounding yourself with in your life, because you gotta, you gotta honor yourself. You gotta prioritize your needs and things that are gonna fulfill you because at the end of the day, it is just you. So what's going to make you feel the most confident and the most authentic version of yourself? Put that first before anything, because it doesn't matter if Susie, John, and Joe don't like you as long as you like you. Yeah. Because you're not going to bed with Susie, John, and Joe exactly. every night. Exactly. You're not going to be with them in, you know, 10, 30 years, whatever. Whoever these people are on Instagram, you know, yeah. they're not the ones that are, you know, in your day-to-day life supporting you and being a part of your personal growth journey. So, yeah. like, you're really doing yourself a disservice when you prioritize other people's desires and expectations over you then you do showing up as your authentic self and living your life the way you want to live it. 100% totally agree. Um, all right. So I, you said you had a little display ready for me. Um, I want to <laughs> talk about, I know I, I've seen you uh, uh, advertise some toys lately, some sex toys on your platform. Yeah. So I want to ask you like, how important do you feel sex toys mm-hmm. are for an individual when they're not in a relationship, but then also what about introducing them into a relationship? Like how important do you think mm-hmm. that is or how much can it help per se? Yeah, definitely. These are my favorite questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, when I saw that, when you told me you wanted to talk about them, I was like, all right, well, hold on. Let me like get some out. <laughs> um, so I have a few of like my favorites here that I'll, pull out in a second but um in terms of the importance of them i think i don't think that they are required in a relationship or as a self-partnered individual i don't think it's required um i do think though that 
masturbation and some form of solo sex can be very, very important. Um, I personally, I'm 26 now. I did not get my first vibrator until I was 24, 24, maybe 25, just about 25. Um, what and made you, even my, like what made you stay, you know what? I'm going to get a vibrator. Like yeah. what was that decision like? Yeah. Well, it was my ex from paradise and I had broken up and I was moving into my first apartment that was just mine. Gotcha. Like, I had lived on my own before, but it was either with a roommate or with a partner um, or, you know, with my family. I was moving into my first apartment. That was like, it was just me. It wasn't associated with any partner or anything. And I was like, whoa, I'm like really about to be on some grown ass shit right now. Miss and then, <laughs> yes, I was like, damn, here we go. Um, and I thought about, you know, just my sexual experiences overall. I mean, my experiences with like masturbation growing up were like pretty minimal. Um, a lot of women will share that their earliest experiences around self pleasure were with squeezing, squeezing of their thighs to orgasm. Um, and that was like my primary mode of my own self pleasure would, I would wake up and like notice I'd be squeezing or I'd be like in and out of waking up, like experiencing that pleasure and that orgasm. And I knew I was going to be single for a hot minutes after I'd broken up um, with my ex and living on my own. And I really didn't want to feel like I had to be dependent on some kind of a connection with a man in order to feel, hold on, sorry. My phone's on do not disturb. I don't know why this is ringing. Um, I did not want to be dependent on a man like or to have a connection. That, that, you know, yeah. urge. Okay. Exactly. And I was really nervous and was like, I don't know, like, do I get a toy? How do I even figure it out? Like, what toy do I even get? I ordered some random toy on Amazon and I was like, my priority was like, it's got to get here tomorrow because I might change my mind. <laughs> so... I got, um, get that, get that it was, prime delivery ready. Exactly. <laughs> I did. Um, and I wouldn't recommend this <laughs> for beginners. Um, it was a step for me and you know, I was so nervous just to take that first step of like, am I really about to insert this toy inside of me right now? And for women, especially for me, cause I have metal rods in my back that go from my neck down my butt. So I don't have any flexibility in my back. I can't like slouch over it is hard to get leverage to like penetrate yourself <laughs> as a woman. Yeah. Um, so, you know, even just for non toys, right. Just for regular masturbation, um, it's a little difficult to do. So that's why for me, there was more of an emphasis around clip play. That's obviously much more doable. Um, I think for me using toys helped me to take my experience of pleasure to a different level and to have, since using toys, I've then also been able to have those moments of pleasure without the toys. Like I've felt more comfortable using my fingers by myself and with partners um, since having the experience around using toys. Um, and I don't think it's required, like I said, but I do think it felt like a real milestone for me. It felt like I was really intentionally entering a period of like exploration with myself. Gotcha. Um, so I think when it comes to relationships as a couple, um, I do highly encourage that there is still solo sex within a partnered relationship um, because that allows you time with yourself uh, to prioritize your pleasure. That can be just about you. It helps you get to know your body um, in a different way. Um, it's also frequently for men, something that they already do on a regular basis. And for them to just not be doing that anymore because they're in a relationship, I think can become a disservice to themselves and to their relationship and cause resentments and all kinds of things. Yeah. Um, I think oftentimes within monogamous relationships, um, 
one or both partners can start to feel like solo masturbation is a form of cheating, Mm -hmm. that it means that I'm not enough because you have to go touch yourself. And I really encourage people to flip the script on that, to reframe that um, as you want your partner to feel pleasure. And this is their relationship with themselves. This is their relationship with their own body that is not a threat to you that if anything will only help in your relationship uh, because they are able to fulfill themselves and feel in a good place with their mind, body, pleasure, all of it. Um, So I think that introducing toys into a relationship can be a super fun, explorative experience for a couple. I think there should definitely be some communication Obviously, as we've talked about, communication is super important when it comes to this. Um, So hopefully there's, you know, open-mindedness. I know, you know, I've worked with people where their partner has felt really intimidated and threatened. And it's felt like, you know, okay, I'm not pleasing you, so you want to use a toy. And I think it's important to look at toys as an added addition to your sex life. Um, It is there to increase. Not a replacement, but more of an enhancement. Exactly. Exactly. Um, And, you know, I know that there's fears around like, oh, well, if we use this toy, then you're only going to like having sex with this toy and not want to have regular sex with me. Um, And, you know, it's just different. It's not that one is better than the other or that one is going to be so pleasurable that you're never going to want the other one anymore. It's very different. They do two different things, right? Like your dick cannot vibrate. It just can't. No matter how badly True. <laughs> you want it to, no matter how badly you want it to, it's a function that it's not going to perform. Yeah. Um, so that's of no, that's of no, you know, uh, jab or whatever to penis owners. It's just not. Um, but I think you know, toys can be a, a form of a gift, right? Yeah. They can be um, something that helps fulfill certain fantasies, right? Like. A couple might have a fantasy um, around double penetration, right? That they don't feel comfortable actually pursuing or having a third person enter the relationship, but they can use a toy to fulfill that form of fantasy. Um, There's a lot of things I could say around couples and toys. Do you feel like, (laughs) is there like a healthy, like in your experience or what you've researched, like is there a healthy amount of masturbation that's like, considered okay or like is there a certain point where it's like okay you have a problem like mm-hmm. between men and, like both men and women yeah so is there a certain amount of um like running that you would say would become unhealthy for someone yeah absolutely yeah there's your answer so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i look at i think masturbation is It can be used for so many different things, but I think at the root of it, it is really very similar to going to the gym and working out. It's a way to relieve anxiety from your body. It's getting your body physically in motion, and it's honestly receiving pleasure, right? Your chemicals are releasing in your brain. You're experiencing pleasure. Um, I don't think that that's something we have to limit ourselves on. Uh, when when things like this become a problem, it's usually because it's starting to create dysfunction in your day to day life. Yeah. If the amount that you're masturbating is getting you fired at work, <laughs> there there might be some you issues might have there. a problem. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. There might be some issues there. Um, and also, like what you said, you know, like as far as you know, it's okay to do it when you're in a relationship. You know, that's your mm-hmm. own relationship with your body. But then also, I can imagine yeah. it's harmful if you're now doing it way more than actually pleasing your partner and they're, you know, left on the sideline per se. And you're, you know, having your way with yourself more so, you know, you know, Mm -hmm. well, it depends. Some people do have a preference for solo sex, but will still be in partnered romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, And there might be some relationships and dynamics where someone who prefers solo sex, like they receive more pleasure and more uh, fulfillment, orgasm from solo sex, that might be okay yeah. in that relationship that that they communicate about that and that that partner does not expect that they have 
an intense amount of sex and that they understand that what's more pleasurable for their partner is to have solo sex. Um, and, and again, there are still ways for that to be a connecting experience um, for both parties involved. Um, again, a lot of that comes down to communication, yeah. though. Like you said, um, like side by side, maybe you're both doing mm-hmm. it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, side by side. Um, there's points where, you know, some a woman might prefer solo sex to where she's pleasuring and, and touching her vulva, but enjoys feeling filled in her mouth where she might have her partner, uh, be, she might be giving oral sex to her partner, but doesn't necessarily want her partner to penetrate her vaginally in any way. Gotcha. Um, you know, that's still somewhat a form of, of solo sex. And again, it's, I think really what's important when it comes down to masturbation and being in a relationship and using toys a is the communication, but also knowing that there you don't have to stick to one thing. Penetrative sex is not the only way that you and your partner can have sex. And that you and your partner really actually get to f- define the rules around what your sex life looks like, around what is more pleasurable for you, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's really up to the two, the three, the four, whatever, however many of whatever your relationship looks like. Uh, for you, you all to figure that out, you yeah. know, 100%. Yeah. I, li- I like that, that outlook. Um, all right. So we're going to mm-hmm. finish up with a little rapid fire. You cool okay. with that? <laughs> all right. I'm cool with that. I do still have these toys here too. So if oh, we want to show those let's, out let's, there. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's just show those since we're all, we're, we're not quite done with the toy topic yet. So let's, uh, go ahead and show the yeah. audience for those that are watching on YouTube. Go ahead and uh, yeah. you know, break down these products for us. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one that I think can be fun for partnered sex okay. um, is this guy. So this is actually a wearable clitoral vibrator. So this goes in your underwear and will press up against your clit, this part right here. Okay. And it has a little magnet on it. So like it stays in place and your partner can actually control this. So really? they can use. Yeah. So I could be so like in a totally different area code and mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. You can be in a different country. Um, there's an app. It's, uh, this is a we vibe vibrator okay. and they have an app called we connect. So oh, wow. literally like I'm in a lot of long distance relationships. Okay. <laughs> um, have and- they ever caught you in a, in a, in a <laughs> spot where maybe that wouldn't be the best idea to uh, get vibrated on? Has yeah. That ever so yeah. like I won't, I won't put it on unless I'm like, I'm open to this being a possibility. <laughs> I'm available from this time to this time, but I'm going to be in a meeting, pretty important meeting. And I don't want to do it exactly. at that point. Exactly. Yes. Um, but even there are times when we're together, right? So there have been times where like I've, we've been at an event and I'll go in the bathroom. I keep this in my purse <laughs> um, oh, wow. where I'll, I'll go into the bathroom and I'll put it on and I'll like, then if I have the remote, I'll either flip them the remote, like as they're talking to someone and then they'll realize and they're like, Oh, and then they get excited or I'll just text them the link for the app. And, um, then if it's appropriate for them to be on their phone, then they'll click it and, you know, we can have fun that way. It's oh, like wow. kind of That's a fun secretive, uh, exploration. Uh, so this is one, um, That's good for beginners. Vibe. Good. It's, yeah, we vibe. This one's called the Moxie. Um, yeah, this one's a good one. Um, for solo and also partnered sex, this is like a fairly common toy. Um, this one is also we vibe and can also be used on the app. Uh, wow. But this is the wand. It looks very large. Yes, <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, it does not. It does not fully enter you. This right here the top up is really all that is used okay this all is just the handle Got it. um so this can actually be used just for like regular massage right like if your partner wants to do it on your shoulders or you know up and down your back um you can do that as well with this but then it can also be used on the vulva um during penetrative sex during um you know foreplay however it really can be used in so many different ways um, one of the big things that I recommend for this and two of the other ones I have here, um, for solo sex and partnered, when you're using a toy like this, that is going on the outside, um, that 
you're not just holding it and like going around your vulva, uh-huh. but that you're holding it in place and you're activating the muscles in your pelvic floor uh-huh. to actually move into your vibrator. Um, so that it's kind of like more, I mean, I guess I've, that you're applying. Also yeah. Works. And it's more like, Sometimes you can kind of freeze up, right? And people will just, body people just stand there, right? Like they'll be masturbating, but they're just kind of laying there and they'll just be rubbing themselves with whatever toy. Um, and really where like the strong orgasms come in are when those muscles in your pelvic floor are being activated. Like when you are having sex, partnered sex, right? You're, you're like gyrating, right? I'm going to say you're like, you're moving your hips, you're activating those muscles. Um, And so it's important when you are using a vibrator, especially like this, that um, you are fucking your vibrator, not letting your vibrator fuck you. Gotcha. Okay. Um, (laughs) That's a good way to look at it. So that's, (laughs) yes. Um, It's called the rock and roll method. Um, I had a a guest on my podcast, um, I think it was episode one of six. Uh, her name's Katrina Marie, and she does these body sex workshops, which were started by Betty Dodson, I want to say her name is. Um, she's She hosts these body sex workshops and teaches the rock and roll method, which is basically fucking your vibrator, um, that like have helped women who have never been able to experience orgasm for the first time in their lives actually experience orgasm. Um, but I guess the last one I'll show here, uh, this is the melt which is just a clitoral vacuum vibrator gotcha. um so it basically like pushes air out of here um and for partnered or solo sex right like for solo sex like i said penetration is a little difficult for me so i'll stick to a toy like this okay. um which again is also we vibe um and partners can activate it whatever we can do a sexy facetime and they can use it um but also during penetrative sex can be used to pleasure the clit while you're experiencing penetrative sex um this one is great this one is one of my favorites uh her name is jill and (laughs) i did they all have names um but jill right here is definitely my favorite um and i think it's a good beginner toy as well for like experiencing masturbation on your own like my first toy was jack um if i could go back and like redo my first experience it would have been more with a toy like jill um two j's is there there like a pattern here just (laughs) no it's like i have i do have a uh sally and i do i do actually have a john um this is john okay so my the ones that are penetrative have like male names and the ones that (laughs) Gotcha. Are just for outside have female names. There's, lo- there's logic to this to this madness. I understand. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Okay, well, um, and yeah, it's like toys can definitely be a little pricey, and that's like what I do talk to a lot of people about too. Um, it's an but investment. it's worth. It's an investment. It, it is worth well worth the investment. Um, wow. We vibe. You can use Taylor Twenty and get a discount for it. Um, it's. I absolutely love all of their toys and highly recommend them, especially because right now during quarantine, it's not like you can, you know, go out and like maybe see your. <laughs> Some people don't have, they can't or... invite their quarantine buddy over. It's too <laughs> yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Exactly. And so doing something like the long distance um, with like being able to control the toy is like a cool way to still be having solo sex, but also have company partner. right yeah. and kind of feel like you have a partner so Absolutely. those are some of my favorites awesome. that I would recommend. Well, well shout out to we vibe and thank you for uh <laughs> yeah. the tutorial there that was awesome um <laughs> have you seen any of it have you like do any of these like uh, do they seem like freaky or no, they seem like, oh, I, like i've seen, seen the one before. i've seen the one that that hooks up before um the last one you showed that hooks up yeah a little <laughs> little hook <laughs> Yeah, so this one, like, it's typically uh, referred to as, like, a rabbit type yeah, of vibrator. Yeah, so it goes in, and then does... it's going to touch on yeah, the, uh, so the clit. This... I got gotcha. you. Yeah, this is on the clit, and then this will penetrate, yep. so it's, like, you get both. Yeah. Interesting. So this is familiar, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's end this show. 
with some <laughs> rapid fire. Yes. All right. So whatever comes to your mind first, let's start. Mm -hmm. uh, book recommendation or book that you're reading now. Um, Untethered Soul. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just quick synopsis. What is it about? Um, oh God, it's about like life. Um, it's kind of a it's like spiritual self-help self -help -ish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Favorite body part on a man. Ooh, um, ass and back. Ass and back. Okay. Uh, you got a good back and you got a good ass. Like you're so good. You're good, you're good to go. All right. Favorite. And a beard, a beard. And a beard. Okay. Favorite quarantine snack. Ooh. Uh, probably what my are, peanut butter cookies. Over there? Peanut butter my, cookies? My ve yeah, they're vegan peanut butter cookies from these, uh, my guys at the farmer's market. They make nice. them here locally. Okay, cool. Uh, first thing or activity you're going to do when you come out of quarantine? Ooh. Sex. Any sex? Okay. <laughs> so I imagine that's a follow-up to my next one. The first person you're going to see when you come out of quarantine. <laughs> I imagine those two have some type of relation. <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, but I think I have to say no comment on that. No comment. <laughs> first we, won't name, we won't name any names. All right. Biggest pet peeve yeah. about a current or past significant other? Oh, um, past leaving the cabinets open after they open them. Like not really? closing the cabinet. Yes. Incredibly just annoying. Just grabbing what they need and just <laughs> leaving it wide open. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Like just close it. <laughs> It's not too hard. All right. How, who is yeah. your Hollywood crush? Oh, um, Jesse Williams, Trevor Noah, Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Okay. Got three, three, three mm -hmm. trio right there. All right. Last yeah. one. Have you ever ghosted a guy? And if so, why? I have never ghosted. I yeah. always leave an explanation. <laughs> so you actually explain to them you're a mature adult and you explain to them why you no longer are interested in them. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. And I wouldn't even say sometimes it's not like a, this isn't why I'm interested in you anymore, but sometimes it's just like a, you know, you know, I think I'm going to like take a break on this for a while. And they kind of get the hint. At least you yeah. say something, right? I mean, it's, yeah. very, it's very mature mm -hmm. of you. All right, Taylor. Well, I, feel bad. I, I want to thank you. So, at least you say something. A lot of people don't even do that, but, um, <laughs> So it's an yeah. epidemic in this country, the, the ghosting. So, um, mm -hmm. all right. So last but not least, I want you, uh, to let everybody know your social handles, talk about your, uh, let's talk about it podcast. Like where can people catch you mm -hmm. on online? Yeah. So the best place is probably Instagram, which is at K Mocha, T A Y M O C H A. And I will share not because I'm Brown, um, the Mocha piece. Everyone always thinks they're like, "Oh, it's hey, Mocha, it's your brown." And I'm like, mm. "No, uh, Mocha Joe was the name of my first cat, and it just speaks to me being a crazy cat lady." Um, I combined our names Mocha when Joe, I was little. Is that from uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm? No, but I just watched that <laughs> okay. season like last week, and I was like, the whole time I was like, "Mocha Joe." Mocha Joe and Latte <laughs> Larrys. Oh God. Yep. Show. Yep. No, it was super good. Um, but yeah, the best place is probably Instagram at Taymoka. Um, I have information for the podcast there, all kinds of stuff on vibrators and my link on there as well. Um, the podcast is called Let's Talk About It with Taylor Nolan. And the podcast Instagram page is at Let's Talk About It underscore podcast. And it's available on like any of your favorite podcast apps. Um, focuses on mental and sexual health and um, any kind of taboo topics and social justice, but mostly sexual health these days. <laughs> awesome. Well, Taylor, thank yeah. you so much for all the insight and the amazing information and your little uh, vibrator show. That was, that was very intriguing. And uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely guys check her out on IG. She's a great follow and uh, just mm. a lot of insightful information. So check her out. Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the health cast yeah. and, uh, Talk soon. Yeah. Thank All you right. so much. Take care. Have a good one. Yep. You too. Bye. -bye.